Hey, what's up, seekers? Welcome back. Can religious rationalism and mysticism coexist? At first glance, you might think that the two are completely opposed. Rationalism places logic above all else, making it truth's final judge. In contrast, mysticism is more a domain of experience, the poetic, and the inarticulate. In the Jewish tradition, however, we find the contemporary mystical movement, which embraces a rationalistic philosopher and legalist, as one of its guiding lights. How could that work? You'd think you gotta be either one or the other. Either you're a mystic or a rationalist. Let's introduce our characters. In the popular conception, Maimonides represents rationalism and legalism in the Jewish tradition. In contrast, Hasidism typifies ecstatic mysticism instead of preoccupation with legal minutia. Could these extremes in the Jewish tradition be harmonized? Chabad, a Hasidic movement founded in the late 1770s, but still actively thriving today, embraced Maimonides. Maimonides becomes one of Chabad's most central figures. His works among its most constant and valued topics of study, and his philosophy, a foundation of its mysticism. In this episode, we'll explore how the rationalist Maimonides could enjoy such a rich afterlife in a mystically oriented aesthetic movement. So first, let's just get some background on the Hasidic movement. The Hasidic movement coalesces in the late 1700s as a powerful spiritual and social force in Jewish Eastern Europe. Many in the existing religious establishment felt threatened by the Hasidic spiritual revival and its tendency to de-emphasize the legalistic and intellectual elements of Judaism in favor of a more imminent ecstatic relationship with the divine and the focus on prayer and devotion over scholarship, which had been a mainstay of European Judaism for centuries. The Chabad tradition offers a counterbalance in early Hasidut. On the one hand, the first Chabad master, Rabbi Shneur Zalman, known as the Alter Rebbe, frequently entered states of trance, mystical union, and ecstasy. Yet, he also possessed the command of the Jewish law, and his Jewish legal writing stands out as classical rabbinic legal scholarship, to the point that even opponents of the Hasidic tradition respected his legal works. Additionally, the Alter Rebbe's voluminous writings, sermons, and lectures on Jewish mysticism have an intellectualistic, philosophical, and systematic flavor. Under the continued leadership of the Alter Rebbe's disciples, his son and his grandson, the Chabad literary corpus grew into the largest body of written Hasidic texts produced by any of the Hasidic movements, a statistic which holds true even until today. Perhaps surprising for a Hasidic master, for the Alter Rebbe, Maimonides' writings play a crucial role. The Alter Rebbe's mystical, philosophical, and legal writings are all nourished by borrowing and dialogue with Maimonides' writings. The Alter Rebbe fully embraces Maimonides in contrast to his younger, highly influential Hasidic contemporary, Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, who accepts Maimonides in his legal writings, but vociferously rejects Maimonides' philosophy. Telescoping forward in the Chabad tradition, the Alter Rebbe's grandson, the Tzemach Tzedek, who was the third Chabad master, also distinguished himself as a, as a leading Jewish legal authority in Eastern Europe, which is again uncommon for an early Hasidic master. Tzemach Tzedek systematized his grandfather's writing and resolved the apparent contradictions between his grandfather's writing and earlier Kabbalah. Furthermore, he synthesized important Jewish philosophical thinkers with his grandfather's thought. Maimonides plays an important role in Tzemach Tzedek's synthesis. But Tzemach Tzedek's interest in Maimonides was not only intellectual. It wasn't limited to intellectual engagement. There was also a large social element. Socially, Tzemach Tzedek worked to stem the tide of the Russian Jewish Enlightenment, and part of that social struggle involved reclaiming Maimonides' legacy for the traditionalists over the Enlighteners. Why would Maimonides' legacy need to be reclaimed? Well, briefly, Jewish Enlightenment was a largely humanistic and secularizing movement that had begun in Germany, and it slowly began to infiltrate Russian Eastern Europe in the 1840s. The Russian government saw Jewish enlightenment with its tendency towards assimilationism as a perfect answer to solving the Russian government's problem of Jewish religious, cultural, and communal separatism from the rest of Russian citizenry. Jewish enlighteners embraced Maimonides as a model for their religious project, which engage in heavy synthesis between the Jewish religion and contemporary prevailing social values and culture. The enlighteners also looked to Maimonides as a model for demythologizing and rationalizing Judaism. Semach Tzedek attended numerous conferences in the Russian capital where he and the Enlighteners battled over the fate of Russian Jewish education. 
Tim Bostetic worked hard in his writing and speeches associated with those conferences, as well as his writings and lectures in general, to reclaim Maimonides' legacy as a staunch traditionalist. Finally, the seventh and final master of the Chabad dynasty, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, commonly referred to as the Rebbe, fully established Chabad's headquarters in America and transformed Chabad into a dynamic, powerful global social movement that is still rapidly evolving and growing in 2022, and by all accounts will continue to do so. From a scholarly perspective, the Rebbe excelled at synthesizing the legalistic domains of Torah with the mystical, and his more purely mystical writings tend to focus on the physical present world as the primary domain of encountering divinity. We'll explore the Rebbe's relationship to Maimonides more fully later in this talk. But briefly, the Rebbe instituted daily study of Maimonides' works amongst the Rebbe's followers, a program of study that exists until today, rigorously followed by the Rebbe's adherents and even spreading to other Jewish groups who do not necessarily view the Rebbe as their leader. The Rebbe viewed this study of Maimonides as cultivating messianic consciousness in its students, a point which we'll explore more later on. Finally, Maimonides' writings are a primary source for the Rebbe's integration of Jewish law and philosophy with mysticism. So that's a brief historical sketch of Chabad's relationship to Maimonides. Obviously, we skipped a lot since there are seven Chabad masters, and we only sketched the relationship between three of them and Maimonides, but those are at least historical benchmarks. And now, let's try and explore how Chabad understands Maimonides in more specific theological and philosophical detail. First, when addressing Maimonides, it's important to know that in Jewish tradition and culture up until the present day, and certainly in the times of the early Chabad movement, there's a bifurcation in viewing Maimonides. We might even say that there are two Maimonides. There's Maimonides the legalist. While some rabbinic authorities opposed Maimonides' comprehensive, clear compendium of Jewish law, Mishneh Torah, when it was first published, by the 1700s, Maimonides' legal writing gained full acceptance by traditional Judaism the world over as canonical. Maimonides received greater authority and sanctity given the important role his legal rulings played in forming the opinions of Rabbi Yosef Karo's 16th century work Shulchan Aruch, which by the 1700s had become the primary Jewish legal text, and Maimonides is unequivocally accepted among traditional scholars from then on. So, Maimonides, the legal scholar, is undeniably sacred to normative Jewish tradition by the time the Hasidic movement emerges. However, there is a second Maimonides in Jewish tradition, and that is Maimonides the philosopher and perhaps the mystic. And here, Maimonides' philosophical work, both the philosophy sprinkled throughout his legal works and rabbinic commentaries, but more particularly in his Muren of Uchim, God and Perplexed, challenged many in the traditional Jewish world. Many chose to ignore the God of the Perplexed and caution against studying it, though this did not majorly tarnish Maimonides' sacred status. Part of this wariness towards Maimonidean philosophy came from Maimonides' rationalism. While Maimonides occasionally writes mystically friendly lines, at first glance, Maimonides' general tendency towards rationalism and demythologization, on display in the God of the Perplexed, and in the more religious and philosophical sections of his legal code, might seem at odds with religious ecstasy and Chabad mysticism. So, we might expect that the Chabad school, with its deep commitment to mysticism and the Kabbalah's symbolic language, might also reject Maimonides. However, Chabad embraces Maimonides. How does this mystical Hasidic school coexist with the rationalist philosopher? The Alter Rebbe, who we remember is the first master of Chabad, writing in the 1700s and 1800s, offers an important teaching to contextualize how it is that Chabad mysticism could be so different from Maimonides' philosophy, and how in general to account for the fact that Judaism articulates itself in so many diverse ways throughout the generation, but how all that could be in harmony and in unity. In an 1806 lecture transcribed in his collection, Torah Or, the Alter Rebbe tells us as follows. We see in every generation and time that there are varieties of divine revelation in the world. In the Second Temple, Divinity revealed itself in the Talmud in a manner which divinity had not revealed itself in earlier generations. In the First Temple period, divinity revealed itself through prophecy and the like. Therefore, we experientially see that divinity reveals itself in different ways, and one generation is completely dissimilar to another, such that in one generation, divinity reveals itself in this way, and in another generation, divinity reveals itself in that way. So, we see the author of introducing us to the idea that earlier periods in Jewish history were characterized by very different forms of divine revelation. We have prophecy, and then we have Talmud, two very, very different modes, but manifesting in different historical periods. The author of it now goes on to discuss more recent Jewish history, outlining the different revelations throughout Jewish history up until this time. He writes, We see differences in divine revelation, 
even in the generations following the Talmud. In the period of the Geonim, which would be the years 500 to 1000, divine revelation occurred in a manner different to that which manifested in the generations of the early Allah Nasizers, rabbis who lived from the years 1000 to 1200. And here, the Alter Rebbe gives us three examples who are all quite different from one another. We have Rif, who was a legalist, but not such a creative legalist. He was more conservative in terms of trying to articulate things in Talmudic language. Maimonides, who was a very creative legalist, systematizer, and philosopher. And then the Tosafists, who were French and German rabbis, who had a very, very different religious perspective than Maimonides. They're often trying to deal with contradictions in the Talmud and their legal writings. And in their more spiritual writings, their world is very full of demons and magic, things that didn't really exist in Maimonides' more demythologized picture of, the, of reality. But nonetheless, the Alter Rebbe is saying that these three thinkers, the Rif, Maimonides, and the Tosafists, are all legitimate streams of Jewish revelation. The Alter Rebbe continues, and so things progress and change from generation to the generation, to the extent that in recent generations, the manner of divine revelation greatly changed. And these are all different modes of divine revelation, just that the hour requires that the revelation be in a particular manner, but the intent behind all the modes is the same. To summarize this quotation, the Alter Rebbe offers us an overview of Jewish history and acknowledges that each generation, and even different scholars within each generation or era, offered seemingly different teachings and paths of worship. Those differences could be stylistic, or in the substance or focus of teaching of the mode of worship. Despite the apparent differences between Maimonides' teaching and Hasidic thought, the Alter Rebbe would see the two as different modes of divine revelation, appropriate to different times and different people, but expressing the same core ideas. And the Alter Rebbe is retelling each era and teacher he refers to are conduits of divine revelation. Chabad would maintain that the principal teachings of Judaism are cultivating an awareness of the unity that pervades reality, peace, commitment to others, to fulfilling the divine will, to transcending the ego. There might be differences on an apparent level between the Alter Rebbe's teaching and Maimonides, but the Alter Rebbe maintains here that the apparent differences are just an external garb, while the ultimate objective of all the teachings is the same. Thus far, we've understood how it is in the Chabad understanding that Maimonides can coexist with Chabad as a legitimate step on the path of Jewish tradition. But the Alter Rebbe didn't only see Maimonides as an earlier step along the path of Jewish tradition's continuing revelation. Instead, he grapples with Maimonides' writings throughout his own, showing how his teachings accord with those of Maimonides. One reason that the Alter Rebbe felt the need to show that his teachings agree with Maimonides is that the Alter Rebbe engaged in a rigorous project of Jewish philosophical mysticism and needed to make sense of earlier sources. He could not offer a philosophical Jewish mysticism without engaging Maimonides' opinions. Tanya, the Alter Rebbe's written masterwork, shows how every doctrine it teaches accords with essentially accepted works of Jewish tradition before it. This includes Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Talmud, the Zohar, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero's Pardes, Lurianic Kabbalah, the entire canonical halachic tradition, and Maimonides' halachic and philosophical writings. Pinning doctrines on Maimonides, or at least showing how they conform to Maimonides' thought, would be a good way of answering the reader skeptical of the Alter Rebbe's ideas. If the Alter Rebbe's religious ideas were consistent with both authorities like Maimonides and the Kabbalah, a point that the Alter Rebbe makes often, then they entered the canon of respectable Jewish philosophy. But the Alter Rebbe likely also held that his reading of Maimonides disclosed a new layer of Maimonides' teachings, which may not have even been available to Maimonides himself. This accords with the Lurianic view on Maimonides, alluded to in the second chapter of Tanya, that Maimonides' soul belonged to the Kabbalistic world of Biria, associated in the Kabbalistic tradition with the intellect. In contrast, the Kabbalists possess souls associated with the world of Atzilut, a world of the subconscious that exists in absolute unification with and directly channels the divine. Fasting forward to the final Chabad master, the Rebbe set up Maimonides' writings in a way that allows us to understand how it could be that Chabad embraces Maimonides' writings. It would be impossible that in Maimonides' limited lifetime, he could have thought of all the many explanations that Latter-day Rabbis gave to his writings. However, Maimonides merited divine assistance to write in such a way that through him, all matters would be explained. And the Rebbe also tells us, these matters became included in Maimonides' writings by means of the divine spirit raising itself within him to allow his words to accurately align with the path, even without Maimonides' intentional awareness. So, 
While Maimonides may have taught rationalistic and even Aristotelian ideas, these ideas could be understood more deeply as grounding many mystical principles. But now we've got to ask, how could Aristotelian philosophical principles that Maimonides adopted enter the Torah canon? And how could Aristotelian ideas go on to ground doctrines of Jewish mysticism and symbolism? In answering these questions, Tzemach Tzedek directly addresses Maimonides' affinity for Aristotelianism. Tzemach Tzedek teaches nothing is inherently wrong with Aristotelian ideas, and if they are adopted by an archetypal holy man like Maimonides, then those ideas too become holy. The idea's status does not depend necessarily on the idea itself, but rather on the person and the perspective with which one approaches the idea. Expanding on this point, Tzemach Tzedek writes in his work Derech Mitzvotecha, this is a major principle, and it is the primary difference between the holy side and the other, meaning the dark side. On the side of holiness, things exist in a state of self-nullification. In holiness, being, ego, is nullified. There is no I. However, on the other side, although those who exist in that state of consciousness know the divine, it does not affect any change within them, for they only refer to the divine as the supreme power, but they do not view divinity as a force, which demands unselfish perspective and behavior. This explains the spiritual archetype of the mixed multitude, of whom scripture says they stood at a distance, meaning to say that they were mere spectators to divine revelation, not participants. Meaning to say you can know a lot of spirituality and know many spiritual ideas, but if it doesn't impact your behavior, then you're a mere spectator, not a participant, and in the Tzemach Tzedek's reading, you therefore live on the other side, on the side of darkness. Now, coming to Maimonides, Tzemach Tzedek tells us, this also explains the difference in philosophical engagement between the holy Maimonides in contrast to the wayward Aristotle. So Maimonides is going to be, of course, on the holy side, and the wayward rebel Aristotle will belong to the dark side, to the other side. For Maimonides, the more he understood divine truth, he humbly withdrew and became less in his own eyes. However, the more divinity Aristotle apprehended, the more Aristotle became a being, an ego, an I. His divine understanding led him to say, I am significant in my apprehension of God's existence and his oneness in my mind with demonstrative proofs. But Maimonides, the man of God, the more he understood, the more he cast himself aside as he perceived the divine before his eyes. To summarize that, strikingly, for Tzemach Tzedek, the problem with philosophy lies not in its inherent contents, but rather with context and perspective. Tzemach Tzedek does not assert any substantive difference between Maimonides and Aristotle's core teachings. Instead, he contrasts their perspectives. The historical Aristotle functions as the archetype of one who uses the intellect to enhance their sense of being and egotism, whereas Maimonides serves as the archetype of using the intellect to achieve a greater sense of nullification and non-being, which is the objective of the Chabad mystical discipline. Chabad's embracing Maimonides, however, was not at all a given for an early Hasidic movement. Let's contrast Tzemach Tzedek's approving take on Maimonides' Aristotelianism with a teaching from Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, an important Hasidic master, contemporary of the early Chabad movement. In Chaim Mohoran, Rabbi Natan, who was Rav Nachman's chief disciple, shares Rav Nachman's teachings on Maimonides' guide, and get ready for a colorful ride here. Rav Nachman tells us, one who wishes to save himself should keep the ultimate distance between himself and books of rational inquiry, such as Maimonides' Book of Logic and The God of the Perplexed. It is a great prohibition to study such books, for they ruin one's holy faith. Happy is one who does not know of these books, and lives with naive simplicity. And our holy master Rabbi Nachman repeated this teaching many times without limit. And even that which Maimonides writes, a bit of philosophy in his legal code, such as in the Laws of the Foundations of the Torah, a section that discusses metaphysics and physics, and the Laws of Ethics, which makes use of Aristotelian ethics in Greek medicine, and the beginning of the Laws of Idolatry, Maimonides' account of the genealogy of paganism and polytheism, one should run away from them and not look at them at all. And anywhere Maimonides engages in philosophical inquiry, one must run away. Our master Rabbi Nachman said that wherever Maimonides discusses halakha, the Jewish law, he did well. But of the God of the perplexed, God should forgive him for having perverted us with unrivaled perversions of the primary doctrines of our faith. And Rabbi Nachman said, one can see on a person's face if they study the God of the perplexed meaning that one's face turns evil if they engage in such study. For such a person destroys the image of God that one hears in them with the study. And we see in our experience that the overwhelming majority of individuals who engage in the study became Epicurean pleasure seekers who rejected the Torah. 
and they should be suspected of transgressing all sins in the Torah. One who studies this book will end in utter destruction. So we can see Rav Nachman did not think one should go near any of Maimonides' philosophy, one should stay far, far away. In contrast, the Chabad tradition offers a more positive and embracing perspective on Maimonides and his philosophy, particularly given that Chabad uses rational inquiry in its spiritual quest. But as we noted, both Chabad and Breslev are Hasidic movements. So how might we account for these divergent Hasidic perspectives? How can you have two Hasidic movements, two Hasidic masters, one who rejects Maimonides and the philosophy and one who embraces it? So Rabbi Yisrael Heller, a living Chabad mystic, once taught that Chabad and Breslev ultimately both seek faith and transcending the conceptual mind. But they do so in different ways. Breslev does so by avoiding the conceptual mind. Chabad, however, strives to use the intellect to ultimately reach a place of transcending that goes beyond the intellect. Now, of course, each perspective is going to say that the other has serious pitfalls. So we're not offering a value judgment on those two perspectives, just stating that they exist. There's much more to this dispute between Chabad and Breslev, and we've seen it play out in the, in the case of Maimonides, but that at least is a short version, and we'll see how the Rebbe tacitly addressed in Nachman's comments a little bit later on in the talk. Now, we've established that Chabad thought adopts Maimonides' ideas, even though those ideas are originally sourced in Aristotle. The details of how Chabad uses these ideas are often quite complex. But simply speaking, Chabad will often use an Aristotelian premise channeled through Maimonides' work to offer for various premises, and let's see how one Aristotelian premise channeled through Maimonides serves Chabad in arguing for three premises. And we're not going to go through the details of the argument because it gets really technical, but let's at least see what these premises are to get something of an idea of how Chabad uses Aristotle. First is the premise of monism. The only thing that exists is the one. There is only one substance. That's one premise which Chabad proves using an Aristotelian doctrine showing up in a few Maimonidean works. Next is the tzaddik. There are individuals who channel divine consciousness and exist in a, in a state of union with the divine. Again, Chabad proves this point using the same Aristotelian premise channeled through Maimonides' writings. And then a third example is mystical union through Torah study, that through studying Torah, one's mind becomes one with God. Again, the Chabad masters prove this point using an Aristotelian doctrine brought up in Maimonides' philosophical and legal works. Again, the details here are quite involved, so we won't go into them now, but there's a link in the show notes to something I've written on the topic. Now, let's move on to discuss a more straightforward intersection between Chabad and Maimonides or Maimonides' philosophy. An interesting intersection between Maimonidean thought and Chabad thought is the discussion of the reasons behind Jewish ritual law, known as mitzvot, which literally mean commandments. Maimonides famously worked to rationalize and demystify Jewish ritual law in the third section of his Guide of the Perplexed. Chabad tradition devotes great energy to explaining how each Torah law is a symbolic spiritual map and may even confer transformed consciousness by mere engagement in the ritual act. Let's look at a timely example since I'm preparing this talk around Passover time. A central ritual commandment on Passover is eating the matzah. Matzah is an unrisen bread cooked hastily according to precise specifications. The Torah tells us that matzah recalls the hurry with which Jews left Egypt, as well as the poor rations they received while in Egyptian slavery. Maimonides in his guide elaborates, Matzah calls us to remember the bad times when we enjoy good times, in order that we have gratitude towards God for the good times and cultivate humility in a modest spirit. Furthermore, matzah serves as a memory aid for the events surrounding the Jews' exodus from Egypt, and it's a symbol for divine power. So we see that on Maimonides' reading, matzah cultivates good social and religious attitude that lead to one's life functioning in an orderly fashion. If you're a person who has gratitude, a person who lives with humility and simple spirit, and view yourself as dedicated to God and believing in God, on my mind is reading, all those things are going to make it such that you live a better life and society will function better. And for Maimonides, that is a primary reason behind the mitzvahs. The mitzvahs, the Jewish ritual commandments, are there to create a stable society in order that people can devote themselves to a higher purpose, which is, on the one hand, pretty beautiful, but it's also pretty rationalistic. In contrast, the early Chabad masters read the commandment to eat matzah as accomplishing several objectives. First, they say, based on the Zohar, that matzah has a magical quality, which inculcates faith and experiential awareness of divine transcendence in monism, 
just by eating the matzah. Relatedly, matzah symbolizes nullification of self. Its flatness symbolizes the absence of ego. In contrast, ordinary bread, which is puffed up and risen, symbolizes egotism. Now, the Chabad masters offer lengthy explanations showing how matzah's physical form and how its Hebrew letters symbolize self-nullification and offer many meditations which bring the contemplative or bring the meditator to a space of self-nullification. What emerges, though, is that at first glance, Maimonides and the Chabad masters appear to offer very different takes on the commandment to eat matzah. Kodah Chabad and Maimonides' perspectives on the matter coexist. So perhaps at this point, unsurprisingly, they do, or at least in the Chabad retelling. But it's not just that Maimonides offers one step on the path of continuing revelation, and the Chabad is another step. Semach Tzedek argues that the Chabad perspective on mitzvot and Maimonides' perspective on mitzvot actually match up and can simultaneously exist. Semach Tzedek's Derech Mitzvotecha, studying on the ritual commandments, teaches that divinity reveals itself in simultaneous layers. So many words before, we spoke about a diachronic perspective, a perspective which goes across time, in which Maimonides and Chabad could cohere. Here we're talking about a synchronic perspective, a perspective in which you have both Chabad and Maimonides working together at the same time. Tzema Tzedek says that each layer is distinct, but reveals a deeper dimension of that which came before it. And here, Tzema Tzedek is relying on the Zohar's metaphor of the body and the soul and the soul's many layers of consciousness as the model for understanding religious ideas and rituals. Maimonides provides the body, Kabbalah provides the soul, and Chabad thought in Tzema Tzedek's rendering provides the core self, the one inner thing that both grounds the two, yet transcends them both. Tzema Tzedek says, Although the Maimonidean perspective explains Torah in a rationally straightforward manner, in truth, the Torah is concealed and revealed. And that which is revealed is in accordance with the concealed. And everything has infinite perspectives. The rational is like the body, the esoteric is like consciousness, and in consciousness there are many layers. So, in contrast to certain rabbis' teachings in Maimonides' project of reading the commandments rationally as heresy, the Chabad tradition accepts Maimonidean rationalism as a legitimate layer in a complex body. I'll leave the task of figuring out how Maimonides' perspective and the Chabad perspective on Matzah match up as a homework assignment. Reach out if you have any ideas on this one. We've established that Maimonides has an important formative role to play in Chabad mysticism, and that the Chabad masters embrace Maimonides in their mystical and philosophical work. Now, let's fast forward and see how the final Chabad master related to Maimonides in shaping the movement for the 20th and 21st century. The Rebbe made extensive use of Maimonides in forming Chabad religious consciousness. First, in 1984, the Rebbe instituted studying three chapters of Maimonides' legal code daily with the aim of yearly completion as a religious directive to his followers. This had significant messianic implications to the Rebbe. Quoting the verse in Isaiah 11.9, the world will be full of knowledge of the Lord, as water covers the sea, which is also the final line in Maimonides' legal code. The Rebbe taught that completing Maimonides' legal code each year, and thereby completing a compendium of the entire Torah, fills everyone who completed the study with knowledge of God, itself embodying a realization of a messianic objective. The Rebbe referred to Maimonides as a guide of the perplexed, both in Maimonides' own generation and in all generations, thereby embracing Maimonides' philosophy as continually relevant, in contrast to many who wish to push Maimonides to the sidelines. Interestingly, the Rebbe praises studying Maimonides' philosophical writings, particularly in the philosophical portions of Mishnah Torah. In contrast, you'll remember from earlier in the talk that Anachem of Breslev explicitly cautioned against studying these sections of Maimonides' work. So we have two famed Hasidic masters who are still extremely influential in contemporary Judaism with very divergent perspectives on how their followers should engage Maimonides' philosophy. Now, perhaps most centrally and interestingly, the Rebbe sees the entirety of Maimonides' legal code, the Mishnah Torah, as a messianic work, telling a messianic story that a reader and community can enact. Taken as a whole, the Mishnah Torah offers a path from contemplatively seeking divine unity to realizing that quest on the lived stage of reality. 
In the Rebbe's reading, Maimonides begins by setting the foundation, the opening of the Mishnah Torah, which is the mitzvah to know God, which of course Maimonides tells us in Aristotelian Metaphysics and Physics. The Rebbe takes Maimonides' Metaphysics and Physics as the scaffolding and the jump point into Chabad mysticism. So on the Rebbe's reading, Maimonides provides a model for the Chabad mystic. The Chabad adept begins by philosophically contemplating unity and mystical experience, but should not stop there. The quest must lead to concrete action. For the Rebbe, the concrete action is the Halakha, the bulk of Mishnah Torah, which deals with ritual and dietary laws, but also deals in great detail with being a good neighbor, an ethical person, a good person to one's family, and all in a way that's dictated by concrete laws and not by mere ethereal sentiments. And just as a note, Maimonides, in his Guide of the Perplexed, section 3, explains how, in his understanding, the ritual laws also deal with cultivating a good and kind society and are not just mere arcane rituals. In the Rebbe's reading of Maimonides' legal code, if one has the foundation of contemplative work and the path, which is following a, a concrete legal regimen, those ultimately lead the individual in the world to the culmination of Maimonides' work, the realization of its last two chapters, which discuss the utopian but very unmagical and very real messianic future to come. The Rebbe understood Maimonides' writings as the final halachic statement on the messianic era and used Maimonides' teachings on the messianic era as scaffolding for many of his mystical messianic teachings. So Maimonides' work serves as the basis for integrating the legal and the contemplative, the rational and the mystical. Maimonides' vision of the Messianic kingdom adds another layer to the Rebbe's Messianic project. Rabbi Nachum Strachs, a contemporary Chabad scholar, notes that Maimonides' view of the non-Jewish other as participating in the utopian Messianic kingdom motivated the Rebbe's campaigns of outreach beyond the Jewish world, a departure from early rabbinic practice. There's really so much more to say on Chabad's rich relationship with Maimonides, but for the purposes of this talk, we'll have to conclude soon. For Hebrew reading audiences or those who can gain access to somebody who will translate for them, there are two excellent books on the topic for those who'd like to know more about the relationship between Chabad and Maimonides. One is called Sachla Tanut Belevush Chasidi, which translates as Rationalism in Hasidic Attire by Rabbi Dr. Yaakov Gottlieb, which offers a 300-page historical philosophical account of Chabad's relationship to Maimonides, covering all seven Chabad masters. Another recommendation is Rabbi Y.M. Izagwi's Dvar Malchut, an 800-page compendium and overview of the Rebbe's creative commentary on Maimonides' laws in the Messianic era. This is an excellent resource if you're seeking to understand more deeply how it is that the Rebbe made use of Maimonides' legal code as scaffolding for mystical and messianic ideas. Let's summarize what we've learned today and conclude. Who is Maimonides in the Chabad Hasidic and mystical tradition? For the Chabad tradition, on the one hand, Maimonides is independently a crucial link on the chain of divine revelation, and everything he says is of great revelatory, spiritual, ritual, and legal significance. The Chabad masters wove Maimonides into their mysticism, philosophy, legal works, and social projects. Ultimately, the Chabad masters, through what they perceived to be their unique divine revelation, understood themselves disclosing new layers within Maimonides' teachings, which Maimonides himself may or may not have been consciously aware of. But, through the course of history, the Chabad masters see Maimonides as retrospectively serving as the vehicle for the revelation of these ideas. Finally, for the Rebbe, Maimonides provides a sweeping narrative which integrates the philosophical and mystical quest in the abstract, but offers a template for making sure that mystics and contemplatives hold themselves accountable in the quest, engage in concrete action, and not only contemplate in the ether, which is a perennial pitfall along the mystical path. The Rebbe, through the vehicle of Maimonides, calls his disciples to form their inner contemplative journey as the foundation for creating a redeemed inner world and helping redeem the world around them. Thank you for watching, and until next week, keep seeking.